repeat after me. Come, Holy Spirit. 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 Amen. Amen. Good morning. I can't resist saying that we could spend a month just on these readings for this week. Really, uh, we're not going to try and do that all today. But we could spend a month on just these readings. Paul says the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. Think for a moment about somebody you know who is weak. Think for a moment about somebody you admire who is weak. I feel like we have a cultural value around strength. And Paul knows a little something about weakness. And Paul knows a little bit more about suffering. He did not have an easy life. He has that list, right? Hardship and distress and persecution and peril. And he experienced most of all of that list. I look at the life of Jesus and the life of the apostles and the life of Paul, And it is a mystery to me how the idea that being a person of faith means you have an easy life ever got off the ground. Like, that's clearly not the case. Right? What is true is that God works in and through all things for good. Depending on the translation, it sometimes sounds like the things are magically working for good. We know better, right? We understand language, the way we use language. It's God that's working through the things. And we're missing something big if we expect as people of faith that that would mean that just the obstacles in our lives would melt away. What happens is God is faithful, and when we are weak, God is strong. And Paul models this. Uh, He never, you know, I would like to read the letters Paul wrote on his bad days. But the ones we have, he doesn't sound discouraged by all of the things that he encounters. Uh, even though he writes, some of, some of his writings come right out of prison. Uh, and, and it was a, a brutal world that he lived in. Uh, but he chooses to see in his sufferings the ultimate victory of God. And in his weakness an opportunity to proclaim the strength of God. And he stands on solid biblical tradition with this, right? If you read the Old Testament, you will find stories where God shows up, where the Holy Spirit shows up, where the divine shows up to lead people through the wilderness to lead people through the battle. There are, there's at least one story where God whittles down the forces. He says, no, that's too strong. If I send you in with that many soldiers, you'll think you did this yourselves. Uh, 
So Paul, in his assertion that what we proclaim is not that as people of faith we are strong, but that God is strong, stands on solid territory, biblically speaking. And when he talks about the Spirit, then I think he's in territory that maybe Episcopalians don't tread in as much as we do God the Father, God the Son. But the Spirit also runs through Scripture, starting right in Genesis, right? The, the, the word for Spirit and the word for breath are one word. And the breath of God or the spirit of God moves over creation. And God breathes into some mud. And that's us. Right? The Holy Spirit enlivens us. I heard somebody say once that God lives in the space between our inhale and our exhale, right? We are vessels for the Holy Spirit. We know we are created in God's image and we are carriers of the Spirit. Uh, I read um, something written by Archbishop Bishop Desmond Tutu, who you may know uh, was in South Africa during apartheid. If ever there was a space where some people were calling into question the divinely loved nature of other people, that, that's a good example. And the Archbishop says that that idea that Humans are vessels for the Holy Spirit. That was one of the things that kept them going in the face of overwhelming oppression and racism. In our weakness is space for the Spirit to move in us and also on our behalf. And then Paul says something interesting. I have noticed a lot, and this could be my particular prism, but when I read the Gospels, Jesus goes off to pray kind of a lot. Have you noticed that? I don't know if Jesus' people were more exhausting than Paul's people. I don't actually think so. But Jesus does have this habit of making time for prayer. Uh, and Paul says, we do not know how to pray as we ought. And of course, this is a letter. So this is one half of a conversation. And in this case, it's a conversation with the church that Paul did not found. So it's people he maybe knows less well. And I would love to know what, what created this just little piece of wisdom that Paul offers, right? He acknowledges, we do not know how to pray as we ought. And he promises that the Spirit prays for us with sighs too deep for words. I have a really good book on prayer called Too Deep for Words, if anybody's looking for a recommendation. Uh, that word for sigh is also, you can, it's also translated groan. So if you're reading Romans just before this, it talks about the groaning of creation, right? Waiting for the kingdom to fully come. And we sigh in that process, we groan, waiting, and the Spirit 
prays for us when we can't. And sometimes we can't for a whole variety of reasons, right? For, for a group of people for whom prayer is central, uh, we do, I don't know that I think we do enough teaching of that. If you grew up in a household where prayer was modeled for you, you heard people around you praying, and that prayer came from a place that was not toxic to you, it didn't hold messages that were devastating, that combination puts you well ahead of the curve, right? Some of us come out of spaces where prayer is rarely, if ever, heard. And some of us come out of spaces where prayer is weaponized. To ask people to be less than or other than they are. And that's toxic. So coming out of those two spaces, there is this learning curve. How do I pray? In a room full of Episcopalians, if I asked you all now to just go ahead and say a prayer extemporaneously, some of you would be deeply unhappy with me. Go ahead, just pray out loud. Uh, I'm not actually asking you to do that. I wouldn't do that to you without warning, but I'm just saying this is something that has to be learned and then it has to be practiced. Uh, and if you have that background of prayer, uh, then the other thing that can happen is just life. Sometimes life hits hard. Sometimes life takes not just your words, but your breath away. There can be moments of deep joy where you just can't even express that thing in words. That's one thing. There can be moments of fear or grief that hit like a cold ocean wave and just take the wind right out of us. It can feel like you're trying to process and that ability to find words just won't quite get into gear. And a lifetime of prayer can fall away right when we need it most and leave us feeling adrift or bereft. Because a lot of prayer connects to our imagination, our creativity, and our language and any kind of stress can shut that down. And so our prayer book gives us what I am calling Robin Hood. <laughs> Robin Hood spiritual life, taking from the rich to give to everybody else. There is very good language in our prayer book. And our poets do this also. Right, coming through COVID, there were a number of poets who started just publishing every day a blessing for the day. And you can now buy the books that came out of those projects. But it was this deep need in this moment where we were having collectively this experience we didn't quite know how to put into words. And the people who had retained their ability with words were able to do that for us. So when we're looking for prayer, we can, we can take other people's words, either right out of the prayer book or right out of the mouths of, of poets and authors and saints. We have a whole tradition of saints, many of whose writings we have. 
And I don't like to assume that if you're in this room, you are already sold on Jesus. A lot of us are. We think Jesus is amazing. But, but that's not a requirement to come in through the door. And I just want to offer that uh, Lynn manuel Miranda, who, who you, you might recognize that name, uh, also wrote a book. And these came out, I think, online during COVID as well. It's called Good Morning, Good Night. And they're just little encouragements uh, for the beginning and the end of day. Uh, so, so if that's more resonant, or if you have people in your life for whom that would be more resonant, I offer that to you. Uh, because uh, it's just super, super helpful to be able to borrow that language. The other challenge that comes is sometimes we have this idea that we will pray and we don't know what to ask for because we cannot quite see our way forward. And you'll hear that sense that God's ends can be a little mysterious. Uh, also in the prayer book, one of my favorite prayers is um, the prayer of Chrysostom, or Chrysostom, depending on your pronunciation preferences. And he uses the phrase, uh, fulfill our desires and petitions as may be best for us. Isn't that lovely? Fulfill our desires and petitions as may be best for us. Right? Here are the things I want, and, and God sees our hearts. And here are the things I'm hoping. And I would like to offer those up, and God, you just you work it out really well for me, okay? <laughs> uh, it's okay not to know, right? We're not expected to know. One of, one of the great glories of being people of faith is that we don't have to feel like we have to have all the answers. And then if none of that language works, the idea of breath prayer or other forms of prayer that don't use language are, are global. Uh, and we can trust that as Paul says, the spirit intercedes for the saints, that's us, according to the will of God, with sighs too deep for words. Frederick Buechner writes about prayer, that the main thing is to keep praying. I'm massively paraphrasing. Uh, he has very good words. Uh, I recommend them. But, but basically, he talks about this idea of prayer as beating down the door to God, right? And he points out, that in the process, we create a path that invites God to come to us, which after all is the point, right? That might be just enough. Because whatever else is going on, we are the beloved children of God and vessels of the Holy Spirit. And neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor anything present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. <laughs>